Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Derek Plavin, and welcome back to episode 31 of How to Practice Jazz Guitar Efficiently. Now, this one today kind of stands alone, obviously, just by the nature of the topic, but I'm going to say it anyway. If this is the first video that you've ever seen on this channel before, especially if you are a guitar player, I recommend that you go back to episode 1 and watch the videos in order whenever you can if you really want to benefit the most because this is like a free online jazz guitar course that unfolds in a logical sort of manner, okay? So as you can see, I'm going to be doing something a little different today, but you definitely don't want to sleep on this, especially if you're serious about making progress just as a musician overall. But this stuff will absolutely carry over to your guitar playing specifically and any other instrument that you may play as well. So the fact that you clicked on this video already is a good sign. Now, I just want to remind you that recently I've been making videos that have all specifically been discussing this overarching topic of things that we may do to improve our time. And I just did a bunch of videos on comping, and while comping is definitely its own thing and deserves its own area of focus, I mean, I just gave you a ton, but I just think that it's good to notice, especially if you've watched all those videos, that all that work that you could do to improve your comping is really just improving your time in a general sense as well. So I've already mentioned in a previous video before the time where one of my musician friends suggested to me that I should try practicing some drums to help improve my time. And he also said something that I found very interesting, which was that he said when a drummer messes up in a band compared to all the other instruments, Typically, it's the most obvious, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it, and as I started to practice the drums, I really started to understand this, but if you just take a very simple repetitive beat of any kind or a pattern with no fills, no deviation, because it is so simple and repetitive and consistent, any sort of deviation from that that is not intended is just going to be easily picked up by the brain. So, practicing the drums can really develop your time feel from an endurance point of view better than any other instrument because no other instrument is going as consistently through as the drums or percussion typically are when you're performing a tune. Obviously all the other instruments typically have space in between the phrases and whatnot, but the drummer is always keeping the basic beat going. So needless to say, I've been putting in consistent work with this since then and I'll admit, I still haven't done any sort of real consistent work on a full drum kit, just because I don't have one, but I have been consistently putting in work on the djembe and the practice pad with the sticks as well, which you'll see in the next video. So therefore, I'm really just going to try to stay in my lane with this. I'm not going to really talk about playing the drum kit at all, and I'm not even going to say that much on technique with any of these things. I'm going to tell you the things to do. but. You know, I'm not going to try to step on the educational toes of any real drummers out there. So if any real drummers are watching this video or the next one, you know, it's open season to mock my drum ignorance, right? But these two things that I will be showing you, the djembe and the work with the practice pad, this stuff alone will still work wonders for your playing and your time if you actually consistently put in the work, okay? So as far as the djembe goes, for me, I would say that I initially got my education primarily from Mike Longo, who was one of Dizzy Gillespie's piano players, but since I've gotten in more and more consistent practice, I've definitely evolved and grown past the point of what I initially learned. So I'll play other beats or patterns, and just my overall understanding of what you can do with this thing and how to play it has just expanded. But the initial knowledge that I learned was still very good. And Mike Longo says that he initially got this stuff from Dizzy himself. And I just want to say, I'm sure most of you are aware of this already anyway, that the stuff I'm going to be teaching today is really primarily geared towards the jazz context. But if you can understand the concepts and whether you're playing these actual beats or even other kinds of beats, the knowledge can still help with a lot of other styles as well, okay? Now, if you don't already have one of these things, I would highly suggest that you invest in one because 
you can still technically practice the things I'm going to show you on like a tabletop or a pillow or whatever you can get your hands on, but in order to really absorb the full benefit of this kind of work, you really do need to play it on the actual instrument and it really does help with things like the feel and the touch and when you actually hear the way these patterns or grooves are supposed to sound with the different combinations of accents and timbres and whatnot, that will just give you a better understanding of the groove overall. So, you know, practicing a full drum kit is probably still even better, but that's even more expensive. So these you can maybe get for around $100, give or take. So it's a well worthy investment. Okay, so the first thing that I want to show you is just what the four main tones are that you could play on the djembe. And just keep in mind that when I say four main tones, I'm not saying that you can't make or musically utilize any other sound on the instrument. It's just that when it comes to learning some of the fundamental patterns, these really are the four primary tones that are used to create the different patterns and whatnot. And if you can Consider this along with the fact that any one of these four tones can be played on either the right or the left hand. You put these different variables together in different kinds of combinations and that's how you create the unique kinds of patterns or grooves. And this is actually really fascinating to me as a music nerd myself because I'm not saying that everything that is played on the djembe is like this. But everything that I'm going to show you today falls under this category and most of what is probably played on the djembe is like this where if you really think about it, all that's going on is the right and left hand are essentially alternating back and forth consistently through relating to one particular subdivision. So what I mean is if there were no accents or differences in tones, you would just have like a right, left, right, left, like the whole way through at a consistent, you know, subdivision. But if that wasn't relating to any, you know, meter or musical context or there were no accents, like I just said, then you wouldn't really be able to pick up any sort of specific groove or pattern. But only when you just add different accents and tones to it, does it actually begin to take on a form. All right. So that's just really fascinating to me. Okay, so I just want to give a disclaimer real quick to let you know that the sound of the recorded djembe in this video didn't really turn out that good in the end, in my opinion, but there are some clips later in the video where it may sound a little bit better because it's actually mic'd up and mixed a little bit, but even in those clips, because I don't really have a good condenser mic to use on the djembe and it's hard to get a good sound with a dynamic mic when recording this instrument, apparently, and also because maybe I could just be lacking in recording and mixing skills, I just feel like it could be better. But the reason why it really matters is because when I'm demonstrating some of these patterns, it may be a little bit harder to distinguish the accented notes from the unaccented, where I know the way it sounds when I'm playing it here in the room, it's definitely more distinguishable. So you just want to be aware of this. And again, thanks for checking out the video and I hope you enjoy. Anyway, it's pretty straightforward. Really, all you got is just an unaccented and an accented version of two different tones. So you got the one in the middle, which, you know, unaccented, and then maybe a little bit more accented. And I guess in a lot of cases, that could be similar to a bass drum or a kick drum. And then you got the one that's closer to like a rim shot, you know, and you got the unaccented and the accented version. Okay, so that's really all it is. So the main pattern that I want to show you now is the same one that Mike Longo primarily taught. And this pattern in particular can be really useful for you, especially as a jazz musician, when it comes to clearly being able to demonstrate the idea of having a polymetric meter existing within the music at any given moment, especially at more of a medium to slower tempo. And as the tempos get faster, that may not always be the case, but I'll talk about that later. So when I say polymetric meter, what I specifically mean is that even within just one bar of the music at a time, we could potentially feel it in a way where we can conceptualize multiple common meters at the same time. And this really just works mathematically. So you're, you're protesting math. I'm protesting math, exactly. So for this particular pattern, I would say that the sort of parent meter is essentially 12-8. So 
because we can understand that 12 can be evenly divided by 4, 3, and 6, that's how we're able to derive our different meters. And we should already understand that 12a is a meter that is basically four main beats that is divided up into three eighth note triplets each. So four times three, that's how you get your 12a. And we usually hear this type of thing in like a blues shuffle, but that's not really how we're playing it here today. Okay, so because like I said before, the pattern is going to consistently be just right left the whole time through with, in this case, eighth note triplets, we can also understand that 12 can evenly be divided into two. So we're really just going right left six times throughout one bar of this pattern, all right? And the way it would be counted would just be one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a, right? So before I show you the different meters within that, I'll try to break down the actual pattern. So I would say the easiest way to understand this would be that if we start with what I just showed you, the only time we're going to play an accented hit, no matter where it is or what the sound is, is on the downbeat of each of those beats. So basically the one, two, three, four of when I counted one and a two and a three and a four and a. When you say the numbers, that's when you're going to play something accented. All right. And then other than that, everything is basically for the most part going to be more on the end of the drum, closer to like a rim shot. And the only time we're going in the center, whether it's accented or not, is on the second time through of going right left so basically it'd be like one and uh two and uh right and three and uh four and uh just finishes on the end all right so if you can consider that and you can consider where to put the accents the basic beat would be like this do something like one two three four So now let me just quickly demonstrate how we can count that differently. So you should already be able to hear the 4-4, four, four, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. But we can also count it as 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, right? And I can also count it as 6, 8, 1 and a 2, uh, sorry, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, Right. And just for those of you who aren't already aware, the only real difference between three, four and six, eight is just how it's being felt. OK, so three, four is more like a one and two and three and one and two and three and where six, eight is kind of really defining the split in the middle where it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that feels different from one, two and three and one, two and three. But they all exist within the same pattern. So what that means is that you could use this pattern over any tune that is played within one of these three meters and it'll work. You just need to understand how it fits within the meter. Now, as far as practicing this stuff goes, I would say the first thing to understand is something that I already explained in some of the previous videos on comping practice, which is that when you're working on this type of stuff, it's really all about endurance in terms of what you're really focusing on trying to develop. And this whole concept of really using the idea of endurance to basically dictate an approach to how I really work on this stuff originally came from my drum practice and then I took it and transferred it over to the comping. But this stuff becomes really apparent when you're practicing it on percussive stuff in particular. So when it comes to practicing this stuff, no matter how you do it, your basic goal should really be to keep it alive as best as you can without stopping and to have it be as close to perfect as possible in terms of the feel, the accuracy of the time, the touch, all that stuff. It should be as close to a drum machine as possible, except it'll have a human touch to it. Now, when I think about it, I can really only find three main ways of practicing this stuff other than actually playing with real musicians and if anyone can think of more please let me know but really all you can really do is practice this by itself without a metronome you could practice this with a metronome or you could practice this along with recordings
So the first thing that I would suggest, which you may be a little surprised to hear me say something like this possibly, but of those three things I mentioned, I personally don't think you really need to spend that much time at all practicing this along with the metronome specifically. And you certainly still can if you feel like it helps you. But to me, when you're playing something like this, because you're already dealing with something that is extremely consistent and repetitive the whole way through and just state the time constantly the whole way through in this repetitive pattern, because the metronome is essentially doing the exact same thing, and that's why when we're playing other instruments, we practice along with it. I mean, the drums can still practice along with the metronome too for certain things, obviously, but in this situation, it just becomes something that you unnecessarily end up relying on way too much when you don't need to, and you're really trying to develop your own internal sense of time. So compared to practicing this just by itself, Doing that is a much better option because it will more so force you to have to take complete responsibility for the time and try as best as you can to keep it consistent and steady the whole way through with good feel so that you can do it hopefully for five to ten minutes in a row without stopping and get it as good as you can or at least that's what you're developing throughout your practice. So. I don't really need to practice that like that for you here, but you know, when you're first doing this, obviously you want to start slow and have it broken down and just get it in the hand so you're comfortable, but once you don't have to think about it and it becomes natural, then you can just practice it constantly, you know, non-stop. But if I were to do it slow, it'd be like... I speed it up. So that's the basic idea with that. And when you're first starting out, practicing it by yourself just like that is a great idea. Now, for me, when I practice the djembe, I mainly play along with recordings. And once you feel comfortable, I would suggest you do the same. And this is different from practicing along with a metronome because even though whatever you may be practicing along with should, generally speaking, be in time, hopefully, but because you're now playing along with humans versus a machine, there oftentimes will exist some, you know, unintentional fluctuation in the time that, as a listener, you may not even notice. Or sometimes it may actually be intentional, seemingly. Like, I've noticed on some of the Jim Hall, Ron Carter duo stuff that there's times where it really seems like Ron Carter is intentionally slightly speeding up or slowing down in between certain sections to maybe create some sort of contrast or effect. But either one of these things is actually great for our practice because now it actually forces us to have to listen to the music and adapt, which is what we're supposed to be doing when we're playing jazz for real. And if you've never done this work before, this will rub your blind spots in your face very quickly because it'll really show you, like, can you keep up with this consistently and, you know, can you stay in the pocket and keep it smooth? Because when you're not, you'll know. So this thing will really efficiently develop your time in that sense even better than just the comping because you're nonstop keeping this repetitive pattern going. So this is really the way to go. And another thing that's good about playing along with recordings is it also forces you to listen from a dynamics perspective as well, because now that you're playing along with the recording, you should really approach it as if you're really in the band. So the more comfortable you get, you may really be listening to what's going on, and if the music is getting louder or softer or whatever, you just want to adapt accordingly so that it makes sense. And you could play this beat along with anything that you want that's in 4-4, four, 3-4, four, four, or 6-8 because it's a polymetric type of beat. So as long as the tempo makes sense for this beat and you're comfortable with it, you can and should try all these different things. Now, I often like to practice the djembe with duo recordings specifically, and this is really similar to as if you were practicing or comping with like a trio record without a comping instrument in it because now you're going to be the comper. So, in a similar fashion, if you're playing with a duo that 
doesn't have a drummer in it, now you're basically the drummer in that band. So it takes it up a notch even further in terms of you really having to listen and lock in and keep it right the whole way through because you will definitely notice that when you're messing up, it'll throw off the whole feel of the band. And I also just want to bring up, because I didn't actually say this in any of the comping videos, but I did talk a lot about playing in a duo, but I never mentioned the specific scenario of playing with a bass player, and that would really be like an exception to some of the stuff that I was talking about when you're playing in a duo, because now the bass player has the bass part and the low end harmonically, so it may be a little different, but you know, just something to be aware of. But when I practice the djembe, I love practicing along with bass and guitar duo records, and even just from a listening perspective, I love that combination. It sounds great to me. So, yeah, first I'll just give you a quick clip of me playing this beat along with one of my favorite recordings to do this with. Okay, so one thing about this beat in particular is because what we're playing is existing entirely on this sort of triplet kind of meter as opposed to a more duple or even kind of meter or subdivision, and this is being primarily determined from where the accents are falling. So no matter how we count it, it's still grouped in three. So if it's in four, it'd be one and a two and a three and a four and a, if we're thinking of it as three, one and two and three and one and two and three and and with three compared to six we can tell that the other accent happens on the end of two and then six is one two three four five six one two three four five six so no matter how we're feeling it we're basically playing triplets and again i'll remind you if there were no accents or different sounds and we weren't relating to any music the right left wouldn't give you any information so what this means is we're really technically limited to however fast we can cleanly play these triplets in a given musical situation. So if we're in 4-4, four, four, typically, for example, you know, as the tempos get faster, we can do a sort of triplet type of thing if we're thinking about it as halftime, where it would be more 6 against 4, which is more of like the footprints type of thing if I'm thinking like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But that's similar, but it's still a different thing because it's halftime. So as far as like the really 12-8 thing goes, you're limited to your technique. So what this means is as you're playing on tunes that get faster, if we're thinking of it at least as 4-4 four, four for now, um, you can use other types of beats where your subdivision is primarily the eighth note. So I'm going to show you two that work well. So the first one is really pretty similar to what the second line march beat in essence is. And the way you're thinking about it is you're playing eighth notes. You're thinking of it like eighth notes now, but you're still going right, left. And you're still going to group most of it in three at a time, which would basically mean that the accents are creating dotted quarter notes. So it would be like one and two and three and four and one and two and... And then on the last two beats, in the second measure, you go three and four and. So let me do that again. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and four. Right? And not that this matters, but if you look at the rhythm that the accents create, you basically get four dotted quarter notes and then two quarter notes at the end amongst two measures. So it's a two bar pattern. And if it wasn't for that last dotted quarter note being an accented note, this would really be like a 3-2 type of a clave. But, you know, I guess because of that last accent, it's technically not, but it doesn't really matter. And either way, this rhythm or this pattern gives us a lot of syncopation and it can teach us a lot. Because it's very similar to the first beat for the most part in terms of how you're playing it, even if you're thinking of it as a different subdivision. So this is really teaching us a lot about the dotted quarter note in terms of creating syncopation for most of this pattern, all right? 
And, you know, this is actually really interesting to me because we're still technically playing these same groupings of three, no matter how we're thinking of the subdivision, but this almost tells us why, as the tempos increase, when you're thinking about swinging, it starts to become not so much about the eighth note triplet anymore, and the eighth notes become more straight, I guess you could say. And it's not like you have to overthink that, but I think that this has something to do with that. So check this out. So now I want to show you another beat that's basically the opposite of that one. And this one really is like a clave, but it's more of a 2-3 clave. And it's basically the 2 is happening in the first bar. So this one will be played like 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 1. Here it is with the music. Finally, I'm going to show you one more, I guess you could say straight or even pattern, except this one fits within one measure of music and it still utilizes the dotted quarter note. And this one sounds like this. One and two. So I hope that that gives you enough information to start with and can get you started. And like I always say, this is really all about consistency. And a lot of the stuff that I've learned from the Chambe, other than what I initially learned from Mike Longo, was really just for me putting in the work. And I say this all the time, but doing the work and putting in the reps will really teach you what you need to know. So if anyone has any questions or anything they want to say, please put it in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate giving it a like and consider becoming a subscriber as well as perhaps becoming a contributor to Patreon where for $5 a month you get all the PDFs that are going to be coming out on this channel. And if you think anyone else would enjoy this content, I would appreciate you sharing it with them as well. So that's it and I'll see you guys in episode 32. Swinging and playing the blues. That's what we, that's what we about. I try to help you